The Other Wise Men, Part 2 By the waters of Babylon, all night long, Vasta, the swiftest of Artemis' horses, had been waiting, saddled and bridled, in her stall, pawing the ground impatiently, and shaking her bit as if she shared the eagerness of her master's purpose, though she knew not its own meaning. Before the birds had fully roused to their strong, high, joyful chant of morning song, before the white mist had begun to lift lazily from the plain, the other wise man was in the saddle, riding swiftly along the high road, which skirted the base of Mount Arantus, westward. How close, how intimate is the comradeship between a man and his favorite horse on a long journey. It is a silent, comprehensive friendship, an intercourse beyond the need of words. They drink in the same wayside springs and sleep under the same guardian stars. They are conscious together of the subduing spell of nightfall and the quickening joy of daybreak. The master shares his evening meal with his hungry companion and feels the soft, moist lips caressing the palms of his hand as they close over most bread. In the gray dawn, he is roused from his boyhoods by the gentle stir of a warm, sweet breath over his own sleeping face and looks up into the eyes of his faithful fellow traveler, ready and waiting for the toil of the day. Surely, unless he is a pagan and an unbeliever, by whatever name he calls upon his God, you will thank him for this voiceless sympathy, this dumb affection, and this morning prayer will embrace a double blessing. God, God bless us both, and keep our feet from falling and our souls from death. And then, through the keen morning air, the swift hooves beat their spirited music along the road, keeping that time to the pulsing of two hearts that are moved with the same eager desire to conquer space, to devour distance, and to attain the goal of the journey. Artaban most indeed rised wisely and well if he would keep the appointed hour with the other magi, for the route was a hundred and fifty parsons, and fifteen was the outmost that he could travel in a single day. But he knew Vasta's strength, and pushed forward without any anxiety, making the fixed distance every day. Though he must travel late into the night, and in the morning long before sunrise, he passed along the brown slopes of Mount Orientis, furrowed by the rocky courses of a hundred torrents. He crossed the level plains of the Nicenians, where the famous herds of horses, feeding in their wide pastures, tossed their heads at Vasta's approach and galloped away with the thunder of their many hooves, and flocks of wild birds rose suddenly from their swampy meadows, wheeling in great circles with a shining flutter of innumerable wings and shrill cries of surprise. He traversed the fertile fields at Kankabar, where the dust from the thrashing floors filled the air with a golden mist, half hiding the huge temple of Aristate, with its four hundred pillars. At Bergestein, with the rich gardens watered by fountains from the rock, he looked up at the mountain thrusting its immense rugged brow out over the road, and saw the finger of King Darius trampling upon his fallen foes, and the proud list of his wars and conquests grave and high upon the face of this eternal cliff. Over many cold and desolate paths, crawling painfully across the wind-swept shoulders of the hills, down many a black mountain gorge, where the river roared and raced with terraces of yellow limestone, full of vines and fruit trees, through the oak groves of Cain and the dark gates of Zagros, walled in by Prisops and the ancient city of Chala, where the people of Sumer had been kept in captivity long, long ago and out again by the mighty portal, riven through the encircling hills, where he saw the image of the high priest of the Magi, sculpted on a wall of rock, with hand uplifted, as if to bless the centuries of pilgrims, past the entrance of this narrow defile, filled from end to end with orchards of peaches and figs, through which the river Ganadae foamed down to meet him. 
over the broad rice fields, where the autumnal vapors spread their deathly mists, flowing along the course of the river under tremulous shadows of poplar and tremoran, among the low hills and out upon the flat plain, where the road ran straight as an arrow, through the stubble fields and parched meadows, past the city of Cestaphon, where the Parthian emperors reigned, and the vast metropolis of Seleucia, which Alexander himself built, across the swirling floods of Tigris and the many channels of Euphrates, flowing yellow through the cornlands. Artaban pressed onward until he arrived at nightfall of the tenth day, beneath the shattered walls of populous Babylon. Vasta was almost spent, and he would gladly have turned into the city to find rest and refreshment for himself and for her, but he knew that it was three hours' journey yet to the Temple of the Seven Spheres, and he must reach the place by midnight if he would find his comrades waiting. So he did not halt, but he rode steadily across the stubble fields. A grove of date palms made an island of gloom in the pale yellow sun, and as she passed into the shadow, Vasta slackened her pace and began to pick her way much more carefully. Near the farther end of the darkness, an access of caution seemed to fall upon her, and she scented some danger or some difficulty. It was not in her heart to fly from it, only to be much prepared for it, and to meet it wisely, as a good horse should do. The grove was close and silent as the tomb. Not a leaf rustled, not a single bird sang. She felt her steps before her delicately, carrying her head low, and sighing now and then with apprehension. At last she gave a quick breath of anxiety and dismay, and stood stock still, quivering in every muscle, before a dark object in the shadow of the lost palm tree. Autobahn dismounted. The dim starlight revealed the form of a lying man across the road. His humble dress and the outline of his haggard face showed that he was probably one of the poor Hebrew exiles, who still dwelt in great numbers in the vicinity. His pallid skin, dry and yellow as parchment, bore the mark of the deadly fever which ravaged the marshlands in autumn. The chill of death was in his lean hand, and as Artaban released it, the arm fell back inertly upon the motionless breast. He turned away with a thought of pity, consigning the body to the strange burial which the Magians deemed most fitting the funeral of the desert, from which the kites and vultures rise on dark wings and the beasts of prey slink futively away, leaving only a heap of white bones in the sand. But as he turned, a long, faint, ghostly sigh came from the man's lips. The brown, bony fingers closed convulsively on the hem of the Magian's robe and it held him fast. Artaban's heart leaped to his throat, but not with fear but with a dumb resentment of the importunity of this blind delay. How could he stay here in the darkness to minister to a dying stranger? What claim had this unknown fragment of human life upon his companion, or his compassion, or his service? If he lingered but for an hour, he could hardly reach Besipa at the appointed time. His companions would think he had given up the journey. They would go without him and he would lose his quest. But if he went on now, this man would die. If he stayed, his life might be restored. His spirit throbbed and fluttered with the urgency of the crisis. Should he risk the great reward of his divine faith for the sake of a single deed of human love? Should he turn aside, if only for a moment, from the following of the star to give a cup of cold water to a poor perishing Hebrew? God of truth, God of purity, he prayed, direct me in thy holy path, the way of wisdom which thou only knowest. Then he turned back to the sick man. He loosened the grasp of his hand, and he carried him to the little mound at the foot of a palm tree. He unbound the thick folds of the turban and opened the garment above the sunken breast. He brought water from one of the small canals nearby, and moistened the sufferer's brow and mouth. He mingled a draught of one of those simple, 
but potent remedies which he carried always in his girdle, for the Magians were physicians as well as astrologers, and poured it slowly between the colorless lips. Hour after hour he labored as only a skillful healer of disease can ever do, and at last the man's strength slowly returned. He sat up, and he looked about him. What thou? he said, in the rude dialect of his country. And why hast thou sought me here to bring back my life? I am Artaban, the Magian, of the city of Ecbatana, and I am going to Jerusalem in search of one who is to be born king of the Jews, a great prince and deliverer for all men. I dare not delay any longer upon my journey, for the caravan that has waited for me may depart without me. But see here is all that I have left of bread and of wine, and here is a portion of healing herbs. When thy strength is restored, thou can find the dwelling of the Hebrews among the house of Babylon. The Jew raised his trembling hands solemnly to heaven. Now may the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob Bless and prosper the journey of the merciful, and bring him in peace to his desired haven. But stay, I have nothing to give thee in return, only this, that I can tell thee where the Messiah must be sought. For our prophets have said that he should be born not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem of Judah. May the Lord bring thee in safety to that place, because thou hast had pity upon this sickness. It was already long past midnight. Artaban rode in haste, and Vasta, restored by, his brief ra- by her brief rest, ran eagerly through the silent plain and swam the channels of the river. She put forth the remainder of her strength and fled over the ground like a gazelle. But the first beam of the sun sent her shadow before her as she entered upon the final stadium of the journey, and the eyes of Artaban anxiously scanning the great mound of Nimrod and the temple of the seven spheres could discern no trace of his friends. The many-colored terraces of black and orange and red and yellow and green and blue and white, shattered by the convulsings of nature and crumbling under the repeated blows of human violence, still glittered like a ruined rainbow in the morning light. Artaban rode swiftly around the hill. He dismounted and climbed to the highest terrace, looking out towards the west. The huge desolation of the marches stretched away to the horizon, and the border of the desert, bittern, stood by the stagnant pools, and jackals sulked through low bushes, for there was no sign of the caravan of the wise man, far or near. At the edge of the terrace he saw a little cairn of broken bricks, and under them a piece of parchment. He caught it up, and he read, We have waited past the midnight and can delay ourselves no longer. We go to find the king. Follow us across the desert. Artaban sat down upon the ground and covered his head in despair. How can I cross the desert, said he, with no food and with a spent horse? I either must return to Babylon, sell my sapphire and buy a train of camels and provisions for the journey, I may never overtake my friends. Only God the merciful knows whether I shall not lose the sight of the king because I tarried to show mercy.